Amen. That's tremendous. We see the evidence of God's goodness, His grace to us. His love is evidenced, of course, by the Lord Jesus Christ dying on Calvary. We see His mercy evidenced before us. Great is God's faithfulness. Praise the Lord for Him. Take your Bibles, please, to Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2. In just a few minutes, we're going to be baptizing three of our young people, and we're looking forward to that. I want to thank again all of our visitors that are here today uh, to view this. It's important for us, though, for every one of us to understand what baptism is, what it isn't. Also, uh, baptism is closely related to two other matters, and that is uh, that of salvation, obviously, and church membership. Uh, so I want us to take a little time this morning and look at these three subjects in regard to a person's responsibility. Uh, to those that are not totally clear on these three things, salvation, baptism, and church membership, my prayer is that you would become very clear to understand what they are and, and uh, your responsibility in them. For those of you that think you have a pretty good handle on it, my prayer would be that you would become even more clear to the point that you could explain it very clearly to other people that you come in contact with. So listen carefully as we go through this and uh, see what God has to say. Father, I ask now by the Holy Spirit's power that you would allow me to share clearly the truth of your word and that we would understand it. And not only understand it as a fact, but, Father, how it relates to us and how we should respond. Lord, through it all, may you be glorified in every part of it. In Jesus' name we ask. Amen. Amen. The general order is seen here in Acts chapter 2. I'll begin reading in verse 36. But Peter is preaching here. It's on the day of Pentecost. And he's been preaching this message. And when he's come to verse 36, he's ending up the message. And he says, Therefore... Let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus whom you have crucified, both Lord and Christ. Now, when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart. They were convicted by the words in which they heard of this message. And they said unto Peter and the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? And Peter said unto them, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit. Um, and then in verse 41, notice there it says, Then they that gladly received his word were baptized, and the same day they were added unto them about 3,000 souls. Now we have here the verse, the conviction that takes place in verses 36 and 37. They heard the, the word they were convicted by the Holy Spirit with the Word of God in their life, and they asked the question, what shall we do? Peter's answer uh, gave them they were to repent, and they were to be baptized. And it sounds like to me uh, there it's talking about uh, salvation includes uh, uh, believing and being baptized, repenting of our sins, turning unto the Lord, and being baptized. But as we'll see in a moment there, uh, uh, it's defined and it's explained that baptism is separate uh, from the salvation part. And so we'll see just a minute there, but repent means to turn from our sin, turn to the Savior, and it is talking about something that takes place inwardly, and that is our faith, that is trusting the Lord Jesus Christ as our Savior. Uh, baptism, on the other hand, is outward. It is something that we're going to view today. We're gonna to see uh, them being baptized. So salvation, faith, is an inward choice where baptism is an outward demonstration. Uh, also, uh, from the message there, we have the response in verse 41, they that gladly received his word. In other words, they that heard the word of the, the preaching that was given there of what they needed to do, they received that. They believed that. They acted upon that. Uh, as we know through other parts of Scripture, and it's explained more clearly there that we are to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. We are to call upon the Lord Jesus Christ. We're to be born again, as the scripture says. That calling is a choice available to whosoever will uh, receive him. And so we have a choice then as we hear the truth of the Lord Jesus Christ coming into the world and dying on the cross for our sin, not his, 
and being buried and rose again the third day. That's the gospel. When we hear the gospel truth and we are convicted by the Holy Spirit saying you need this and we make a choice to receive what Jesus did as our payment of sin, salvation takes place in our life. That's an inward choice that we respond to. And then they that believe, they that were genuinely saved, they were baptized. And then they were added to them, to the church. Um, the church, church is what? It is an assembly of people. Um, it is not a building. And so, and I'll tell you that again in a moment. But uh, they, we have the, the order of events then. Salvation by believing, by trusting the Lord Jesus Christ, receiving the word, as it said. Then there was baptism by water. Uh, immersion is the, is the best picture, as we'll see. And then there was membership in God's church. That's the order. That's the order that we abide by here in our church. You cannot be a member of Holy Hills Baptist Church until you first have been genuinely saved and then have been uh, baptized by immersion after that. And then you're qualified to be a member of the church. And so understand the general order that is given. Then there are some specific items I want us to look at. Obviously, there is salvation. Uh, a person can be saved and must be saved um, in order to be a member of the church and, and even to be baptized. I've had some people say, well, I just got baptized here. I'm, excuse me. I just got saved uh, under your preaching a, a few a weeks ago. Um, uh, I'd like to join the church. And I'd say, well, uh, we'd like for you to be baptized. Say, oh, I was baptized when I was 12 years old. And then I have to explain to them, no, you got wet when you were 12 years old. <laughs> you see, baptism, as we'll see, is a picture of salvation. And if you weren't saved, you didn't have a picture of anything. You can't take a picture of nothing. And so the picture comes after uh, the fact. And so we have here uh, that man needs, first of all, salvation. Um, it has to do uh, this need with our sin problem. The reason that I needed to be saved, uh, and, and I was a good little boy, I have to tell you. Uh, I was a good person. I went to church. Uh, my parents took me to church. And, uh, and I was obedient, because if I didn't, I got it. Okay. And so I was a good person overall, but I was a sinner still. You know why? Because I was born as a sinner into this world. We all come into the world as a sinner. We all come into the world, as John 3 tells us, that we're condemned already. We're already under that judgment. And unless something changes, we're going to die in that condition. And God cannot just overlook sin. He cannot just let sinners come into heaven. That's the very purpose of why he sent Jesus Christ into the world, uh, so that he could pay that penalty price for us. But let's get back here to the need. If you'll flip it with me over to Romans chapter 3, and the Apostle Paul, God directs him to make it very clear to us about what God thinks about us uh, and our sinfulness, and even what we think about ourselves or what we should know ourselves. And verse 10 of chapter 3 of Romans says, As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one, not even little Randy Blackwell. There is none that understand it. There is none that seeketh after God. They are all gone out of the way. They are together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good. No, not one. God says, and do we get it? I mean, repeated over and over and over several times there, that there's no one in God's sight that is good. We all have failed. We all have, have come short of something we'll see. And what we've come short of is told to us down in verses 19 and 20. It says here, now we know, this is something that we know. We know that whatsoever things uh, the law saith, it saith to them that are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped. That is, my mouth would be stopped saying I'm a good little boy, because I wasn't in God's eyes. And all the world may become guilty before God, guilty of sin. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight. 
for by the law is the knowledge of sin. In other words, God gave the law to tell us this is what perfection is. This is what I expect. Be holy for I am holy, saith the Lord. And as we try to keep the law, none of us can measure up to that perfect standard. We know this, the scripture says. We know that we fail. That's why verse 23, as you go into look, says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, God's glorious standard. We're all in that condition. We're born in that condition. We live in that condition, and unless we make a choice to change that, that condition, we will die and go to God's judgment, which is hell, it's called, in the lake of fire, and it is a place of torment by fire, and it is a real place, and it's not any place that we want to go to or shouldn't want to. There's some crazy people out there that don't know what they're talking about. They think, oh, I'll be fine in hell. It's going to be there with all my friends. We'll have a great old time until the second after they set foot there and they realize this isn't what I thought it was going to be. It's no place that anybody would want. And uh, God doesn't want us. He's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And so that's why he sent his son. So we have here the need. There's a great need. The penalty of our sin is death. Sin causes death. Romans 6, 23 says, for the wages of sin is death, not just physical death, but separation from God and all that's good of him for, for all eternity in that place of hell. Uh, even, even our best works that we can do, God describes them in Isaiah 64, 6, all of our righteousnesses are as filthy rags in his sight. That's how far we miss the mark. And so we have a need and then understand God's provision. Uh, J.T. read in John 3, 16. Most people know that verse quite well. For God so loved the world that he gave. His only begotten son he gave. That whosoever believeth him, that is put their trust in him, we'll see, should not perish, should not have to die and go to hell and, and be in that torment of place, place of torment, but have everlasting life with God in heaven. And that's what he has done. That's what his plan was. Uh, as I said, a holy God could not let sinners come into his presence in heaven. He cannot just overlook sin because he is a just God, a righteous God. That sin had to be punished. And so he loved us enough to give his only begotten son to come and take our place, to take the punishment that we deserved and to take it upon himself. And that's what he did exactly as that. He loved us that, that much. That's why Jesus Christ came. And he said in John 14, 6, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me, Jesus said. And so he is the way, not a way, but the way in which to get to God's heaven. Uh, Acts 4, tw uh, 12 says, Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. It's only at the name of Jesus Christ. It's only by him that we can have that salvation. And Jesus Christ became God's love gift unto the world. Amen. That's what that John uh, um, uh, 6, 23 uh, says as you read it there. The wages of sin is death, but... The gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. We have that love gift that's given. And what do you do with any gift that is offered unto you? Well, you have a choice to make. You can receive it, accept it as yours, or you can reject it. Say, no, thank you. I don't need it. Uh, that's pretty much what you can do. Uh, you can try to say, well, you know, I uh, might need that. Let me think about it. You know, I, I, I might come back next week and make a choice. Well, when you do that, guess what you've done? You've said no until you say yes. <laughs> so you're still guilty. Uh, you're still uh, headed toward hell until you make the choice to receive Christ. So that leaves us then with that choice. What do we do with that love gift? We've got to either receive it or reject it there. John 1, 12, Jesus said, but as many as, uh, no, John wrote there, as many as received him, as received the Lord Jesus Christ, to them gave you power to become the sons of God or the children of God. 
those that believed and made the choice to receive Jesus Christ is theirs. That's what salvation is. It's when we come to the point where we recognize we have a need. And we say, Lord, I need your provision. I need what you gave of Jesus Christ, your son, who died and was buried and rose again the third day, who paid my sin debt completely. I want that payment of sin to be credited to my account. I want that forgiveness. I want the righteousness of Jesus Christ to be deposited to my account as well. That's what he offers to us, and we have a choice to receive it or to reject it, to leave it. Also, the next verse there in, in uh, John 1, 12, uh, verse 13 says this. He says uh, that uh, which are born, were born in the children of God, which are born um, not of blood. And it's not talking about the blood of Jesus Christ. I mean, we talked about that a while ago when we sang about it. Uh, what can wash away our sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. But we're talking about here uh, descendancy. Uh, blood's thicker than water, that type of blood, you know. Uh, our relationship and so I've met people before when I witnessed to them and said, oh yeah, you know, my, my granddaddy was a Baptist preacher. I said, okay, what about you? My daddy, you know, my parents raised me in church. I went to church all the time. I'm not hearing anything yet about that you know the Lord Jesus Christ is your savior. You see, it's not by blood. It's not by relationship. Just because your parents were saved doesn't mean that you're saved. Just because you went into a church building every week doesn't mean that you're a believer in Christ. No more than going and sitting in your garage makes you a car. It, it doesn't work that way. You've got to make a choice to receive the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior. It's not by blood, human descent. It, nor is it by the will of the flesh. In other words, you can't roll up your sleeves and say, I'm just going to put forth the effort and I'm going to do the best I can and I'm going to make it. Hopefully, my good works will weigh, outweigh my bad works and God will let me in his heaven. It doesn't work that way either. It's not by human effort of the flesh, nor is it of the will of man. In other words, you can't come to me and say, Pastor, will you pray for me and get me into heaven? Nope. Can't do it. Not that I wouldn't want to, but it doesn't work that way. I can pray for you that you'll make that choice. But when it comes down to it, you've got to make the choice. It's on your plate. It's left up to you. Whether you go to heaven or hell is your choice. Amen. And we have to recognize that and come to the point where we make the choice to receive the Lord Jesus Christ as Savior. That's what salvation is and, and the details of it. Now look with me at baptism very quickly. In Acts chapter 8, uh, we'll flip over to Acts chapter 8. Uh, uh, baptism, as I said, is not salvation. Uh, in Philip's uh, uh, message um, uh, to the Sumerian, uh, in Samaria there, in verse 12, 8, chapter 8, and verse 12, he says there, it says, But when they believed Philip preaching uh, the things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, when they believed, when they trusted the Lord Jesus Christ, we could say, they were baptized, both men and women. All right. Once they believed, once they got saved, then they got baptized. Uh, we look over further uh, to uh, verses 35 through 38. is talking about here Philip in um, a message there or talking to a man that was called the Ethiopian eunuch. Uh, he was a eunuch, and uh, he was riding on a chariot. He was sitting on a chariot, rather, and he was reading uh, in Isaiah. Um, and it tells us uh, the part that he read there in verse 32 uh, is, uh, he was led as a sheep to the slaughter, and like a lamb dumb before his share, uh, so opened not his mouth. That's Isaiah uh, 53 and verse 7 and 8 uh, talking about. And he said in that passage there, uh, he says, had some questions and Phillips began to explain to him uh, about uh, what it was talking about, who it was talking about. Um, and he shared there, um, and in verse uh, 35, it says, And Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. Uh, Isaiah 53, 6, what does it say? Uh, All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord hath laid upon him the iniquity of us all, him taking our place. 
Uh, he explained from that same scripture. And uh, they went a little further on their way in verse 36. And they came into a, a certain water. And the eunuch said, See, here's water. What doth hinder me from being baptized? Why can't I be baptized? And he only gave one reason why he would not be able to be uh, baptized. He says, uh, If thou believest with all thy heart, thou mayest. The only thing that will keep a person from not being baptized if they have, is if they have not believed on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. If they have not placed their trust in his work on Calvary. That's the only reason why a person should not be baptized. Every person that has been baptized, excuse me, has received Jesus Christ, should then be baptized and follow him. So we see the difference between the two. Uh, since baptism there is given to us, uh, um, and it is uh, uh, not only something that we um, think is a good idea if we feel like it, or if I'm not scared of water, or if I'm not embarrassed to be in front of people, or no. It is something that is exemplified by the Lord Jesus. He was baptized. It's commanded by God, Acts 10, 48, and he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. That makes it kind of clear. Um, it's even commissioned to us in, in the Great Commission. Um, in in uh, Matthew 28, 19 and 20 in the Great Commission, it tells us, it says, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things which I have commanded you. And Lord, I'm with you always. Um, he says, Go into all the world and teach. And he says then in, in the next verse, teaching them. All right, there's two teachings. There's two separate words for it. The first one has to do with make disciples of. In other words, lead them to the Lord Jesus Christ that they can be saved. The second thing that happens is then they are to be baptized, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. And then thirdly, we're to teach them the things God has commanded, the Lord has commanded. And so all of that is part of it, but there's an order there. And once saved, then they were to be baptized. And that is the command of God that he has given unto us. So that's baptism. And then thirdly, <clears throat> oh, by the way, you know, I might as well do it now, so I might do it later. Um, baptism pictures two things. As I said, it's a picture of what they're going to do. Uh, there are three positions in baptism. All right, the, Those of you that have been in our church for some time, y'all know this. I can get you to come up here and tell it, right? She's, she's already doing it right there. Yeah. Uh, standing in the water, going under the water, and then coming back up out of the water. That's why immersion is important. It's the only one that pictures this. It tells two things. One, it tells, first of all, what they believe. They're saying, I believe in the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. All right, It's a testimony to all of you what they are saying they believe. And then secondly, they're testifying what has happened happened to them their old sinful nature their old sinful man has been crucified their life has been crucified with the lord jesus christ and buried with him and they have been given new life in jesus christ second <clears throat> corinthians five seventeen. if any man be in christ he is a new creature a new creation all right there's a new life that has sprung out uh, in them. So we have that as a picture also with baptism. And then the third thing I wanted you to understand is about church membership. Uh, first of all, see the importance of it. And Jesus said in Matthew 16, 18, uh, and upon this rock I will build, whose church? I will build my church, he says, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I will build my church. It is Christ's church. This church belongs to the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Now, again, as I said earlier, this church, is, I'm not talking about this building right here. This building is not a church without the people. Amen. You know, the little thing that you've done before, you know, <laughs> here's the church, here's the steeple, open the door, and here's the, the people. Uh, a church, the word ecclesia, in the Greek means uh, assembly, a gathering. Anybody notice anything new in the, in the uh, uh, four year as you came in? Yeah. yeah. The word gather, uh, all right. Uh, that's where it comes from. I just put that up this past week. Um, but it means to gather together. We are a gathering, we are assembly, we are a church. Without the gathering, there is no church. Could I say this 
to those of you watching right now online, okay, and the rest of you listening to understand this. If you're shut in and you cannot get out to the store, to the restaurant, to the game, I understand this is the only way that you can get the truth of God's word on a regular basis. If you're sick and cannot get out, I understand. Uh, temporarily, that could be. But if you're not sick and you're sitting home to sit in your comfortable chair and to watch this service and call it church, you're lying to yourself. You're deceiving yourself. That is not church. That's listening to a message. And I, I can understand it. It's for a purpose there temporarily or if you're shut in permanently. But if you can get out, we are to come together and assemble together as a church. And that is what we're to do. And it's because it's Jesus' church. It's his important church. He's the one that, that started it. We are to be gathering in his church. And so I encourage you with that to understand the importance of the church. It is his church. Secondly, the importance of church membership. Uh, how do we get that? Uh, it's being officially identified with the local church. It's exemplified again over there in Acts chapter 2, verse 41. It says they were that glad to receive his word, were baptized. And listen, it was the same day they were added unto them about 3,000 souls. That's a lot of people uh, here to this first church. They were added to them. What does that mean? Why well, say it? Because they were added to the official numbering of who was involved in that church. And that's what church membership is. It's an official identification with the local church. You could say, if somebody asks you, uh, what's your church? Is oh, I go to Holly Hill Baptist. That's my church. You know. Well, that's great. But are you a member? of Holly Hills Baptist. See, membership is important. Uh, it is through membership uh, that we worship, uh, we serve, we, we learn, we encourage, we fellowship, we go in, out into the world to evangelize and say, well, pastor, can I do that by just attending? Well, some of the things you can do, but um, you're limited. You can't do all of that. There are some parts of serving in our church you can't do without being a member of the church. Uh, we're not going to just let anybody go and, and take our children back here for children's church. Okay, uh, You don't sing in a choir unless you're a member of the church. You don't teach a Sunday school class unless you're a member of the church. I say, good, I didn't want to do any of those things. Again. <laughs> no. oh, wait a minute now. <laughs> Let's get back on track with what God is saying. We are to recognize this is the church belongs to Jesus Christ. It's his church. We want to officially be identified with it. And, uh, and the way we do that today in the New Testament church is through church membership. I encourage you with that. So let's get then to the last thing I share with you, and that's the individual choice. When it comes to salvation, obviously we know that there's the individual choice. As I mentioned earlier, what are you going to decide? There's three choices you can make. Acts 17, 32 through 34 tells us about them. I won't take the time to read them. But in those three choices there, there were some when they heard the Paul's message that he had preached, uh, there were some that mocked. That is, they said, hey, I don't need that. That's ridiculous. I, I, I'm okay with, with what I'm doing and how I'm living. I don't need that kind of stuff, all right? They mocked. They, they rejected completely. There was others that said, I'll hear you again. Uh, they postponed. They, they procrastinated. They, they put it off. In other words, when they left out, they neglected to make a choice for uh, the Lord Jesus Christ. So they stayed in the same condition that they came in, you may say. And as I told you, we're born as sinners into the world. If you neglect, if you postpone, you're still in the lost condition. And that's a dangerous place to be. Um, and then third, there was some that believed, that truly made the choice to receive Jesus. Deuteronomy 30 and verse 19, God says this. He says, I call heaven and earth to witness this day against you that I have set before you life and death. We could say eternal life and eternal death of separation. The wages of sin is death. I've set before you blessing and cursing. The blessings of heaven, the cursing, the judgment of hell. Therefore, God says, choose life. That's God's desire. 
Choose life. But you must make the choice. The choice is yours to make. Don't put it off. You're not guaranteed tomorrow. The choice is right now. 2 Corinthians 6, 2. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Certainly, that is the choice that should be made for salvation. If you're here today, you've never made that choice, whether you're a regular attender of this church or whether you're visiting here today, it doesn't make any difference. God has placed you here and heard a message that he is speaking to your heart, and you need to make the choice to receive the Lord Jesus Christ, and you need to do it today. That's as he's speaking to you. Don't put it off. Secondly, for baptism. Since baptism is commanded by God, uh, then it's a matter of our obedience or disobedience. What do you call disobedience? Sin. Let's call it sin, okay? When we disobey God, it's sin. And so if you are saved, you've trusted Christ as your Savior, you know that, but you have not been, uh, you've not followed him in scriptural baptism, then you're in disobedience unto his command. And so I encourage you to make the choice. Uh, it's a matter of your fellowship with, with the Lord or your separation from him because of your sin. Uh, it's a matter of just saying, yes, Lord. And as I preached last week about lordship of Jesus Christ, you can't say, no, Lord. That's contradictory. If you say no to Jesus Christ, he's not your Lord. You see? And so the proper answer is yes, Lord. We're to submit to what he says. And then for church membership, they're recognizing uh, it is God's church and therefore it is important and it's designed not only for our association, but for our participation. Uh, church is not a spectator sport, okay? We're not here just to sit and listen and be entertained. I never come in on a Sunday morning prepared to entertain people. God didn't call me to be an entertainer. He called me to be a pastor. A pastor tends the sheep, feeds the sheep. We are God's sheep. My sheep hear my voice. They know me. They follow me. And I give unto them eternal life, Jesus said. They shall never perish in hell. That's what God wants for each one of you. And I hope you'll make that choice today. Whether it's salvation, baptism, or church membership. Decide. Don't just decide to do it. Do it. What Jesus Christ says. Every head bow, please. We're going to have an invitation here in just a moment. I've asked just for the instruments to play. They can start playing just as soon as they're ready. But in this invitation, I'm going to ask, if, first of all, those that are going to be baptized, if they would go ahead and make their way to the room and, and start getting ready to, to uh, be baptized. You can go ahead and do that right now. For the rest of you, uh, let's go ahead and stand, everyone. And as they're playing this, would you make any choice that God has placed upon your heart? Whatever God has touched your heart about, whether it be salvation, whether it be baptism or church membership, would you respond? We've got time right now. If you come forward, especially if it's for salvation, I'll have somebody take your side and, and deal with you about that. If it's baptism, we can take that information and get you scheduled for the next one. Church membership, I explain how that can work. Will you come right now as we're listening to the, to the music play? I'll be glad to meet you right now in front.